And so, one second. There we go. Greetings, everyone, and welcome. Um, welcome to September, the end of September, where depending on where you are in the world, it's either autumn or it's spring, and uh, it's either morning or it's evening or somewhere in between. We are thrilled to um, have everyone together, to have such a big crowd, um, and of course, for our featured uh, um, guest and presenter um, this evening, um, which I'm sure has everything to do with why we've uh, uh, found such a big crowd of people. Um, before we introduce Joan again, um, we want to just say hi um, and welcome. Um, if we, we've got a number of faces that we recognize, so many of you, um, and we know that everybody's kind of in and out and everybody's trying to get their their bearings with the new school year. Um, I hope that no one um, feels insecure about having been gone for a while and then all of a sudden being back. We're thrilled to have you and you should just come to the VDM whenever it fits. And so if if the timing is not quite right because we're we are uh, hosting for the other side of the world, don't feel guilty. And if your week was just overwhelming and it wasn't an easy one to get to, same thing. And we're just thrilled to have you when you can be here. Um, the agenda for today is in the chat. And so um, if you haven't clicked it yet, you should go ahead and click that. And then you'll see as you scroll down that there's a link for some materials that Joan has sent ahead. And so um, by all means, click on that. Um, I'll also invite you to um, type your name and where you're from in the chat if you desire, if you're so willing. It's just fun to see how many corners of the globe we have um, together. and. Uh, uh, on a night like tonight, we have people from literally every corner of the world. So it's extra exciting to see how many uh, how many different countries and different places are represented. Um, so I always think that's extra fun. Our routine uh, from the beginning. Um, well, first of all, let me introduce again, Veronica Bileski and Emma Shubin, my co-hosts. Um, they, um, I don't know if, uh, uh, do either of you have any opening words before we uh, do a quick breakout room? Let's We're do that and then still, we'll do announcements. And, yeah, yeah, we'll do announcements after. Okay, so our, our routine um, almost from the beginning has been to um, uh, take just three minutes to um, split into a couple quick breakout rooms. Um, uh, at this point, we're gonna do 10 breakout rooms. Uh, and once you get to the room, um, please quickly, you don't have much time at all, quickly introduce yourself and tell everybody in the room where you're located and who do you teach or who did you used to teach or who do you wish you taught um, some statement about that uh, and uh, probably before you have a chance to get back i'll pull you out of the room and we'll be right back here with everyone and we'll get into the main work of the evening so um get ready go to your go to your rooms and say hi to everyone and go All right, there's everybody. We did it. All right, so we're back in. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to um, uh, Veronica for a moment. I think there's maybe a couple announcements. Um, yes, first of all, just welcome. Really lovely to see all of you and very exciting to meet some new people that I haven't seen before, so welcome. Um, if you are new, um, make sure that you get onto the VDM mailing list. Um, that's the best way to get the Zoom link for all the meetups and to um, find out about other meetups, other presenters who are gonna be sharing at these free discussion meetings, and then also to find out information about our um, registration-based uh, masterclass series. Um, and we, we send about two emails a month and we'll like resend the same email um, within 48 hours just to make sure you don't miss it. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, we just wanna say welcome to everybody. Um, our next couple events are, um, we have a masterclass with Pablo Cernic, and that masterclass is on either Saturday or October 16th, if you live in the Americas, or on Sunday, October 17th, if you live in 
Asia and Australia and people in Europe and Africa can um, stay up really late. It's at like in the middle of the night for them. Uh, so all of these master classes are also available um, on recording. Um, so if you sign up for it, you get access to it if you come live and you'll also get the recording afterwards. And if you can't make it live, then you'll also get the recording um, for 30 days. Um, and for everybody, please note that the class with Pablo is at a strange start time. Like we usually try to keep everything at 2 and 9 p.m. Eastern time, but this one like is an hour earlier. So just double check the start time for that class if you're already registered for it. Um, and then we actually have another meetup before that on October 12th or 13th. And that's the, that's the kind of meetup that is better for people in um, Europe and Africa. It's more at their awake time. So I think this Asia Australia crowd might be sleeping, um, but you're also welcome to watch the recordings afterwards. So all of the recordings are on our website. Um, and we just invite you to participate in this community as you can, when you can, as it's useful. Um, Emma, do you want to talk about scholarships? Sure. Um, one of our joys to partner with Integral Steps, which is an organization that Veronica and I help run, um, is that we are able to offer scholarships and we would love to support you or anyone else that you know who would like to join us who may not be able to afford to come. We want a welcoming new people to our community. And it's just such a joy to see everybody here from all over the world. Joan, we are so honored to get to hear from you tonight. Um, our next meetup will also include some of our friends from Poland. I think we have two or three Polish guests who are going to be presenting among other exciting things that are going to be happening. And Pablo's class should not be missed. But um, I think without further ado, we, we can't wait to hear from Joan. And thank you all for coming today. It's just a joy to see everybody. So uh, I think that's the I think that's our cue. So um, I first met Joan Pope oh at least fifteen years ago or so I believe maybe my first introduction. Um, uh, Marta Sanchez invited Joan and a whole number of other uh, uh, international illustrious Dal Crozians to Carnegie Mellon um, to one of our international conferences, and um, I had just the thrill of sitting in on a class or two with her. And then I've had a couple more um, chances to say hi in Geneva. And every time I've ever been anywhere near Joan Pope, the energy has always just been so high and the excitement so sincere. Um, and, uh, and so we're just thrilled um, that uh, technology has made this all possible. Um, so without uh, further delay, I'll, uh, we hand the floor over to Joan. Um, it's all yours, Joan. Okay, energy plus about to be switched on, not physically, because um, about four weeks ago, I dislocated my hip. So I'm sitting down. Um, when I move around, I have a, a three, three wheeled, obviously called tri. So this is called Trixie, a three wheeled walker. And I'm currently also using one of those gopher things, which I call my little red engine, because I won't be driving for some months, unfortunately. However, the physio exercises are, are helping a lot. So the energy is vocal at the moment. But just to make sure that you know, this is the show and tell part I always love. Of course, here is a black swan sailing past. Uh, we live near the Swan River. And black swan in the indigenous language here is Mali. And this morning I fed two kookaburras, or at least I fed mum kookaburra, uh, who then in turn sat on the fence and fed a very large baby kookaburra, twice as big as she. There we are. Also, to show you that it's springtime, these uh, Western Australian wild everlastings, well, like the word immortal, they're not really everlasting, but they do hang around for a long time. And from my garden this morning, I also picked a lovely spring flower. This is a bottle brush. It's a type of melaleuca. I hope you can appreciate it. And Catherine, you take it home as my little gift to you. Catherine has been helping. All right, now, having done a little intro like that, I find myself kind of reviewing things. Um, I'll be I'll be 87 next birthday, and I'm one of the things I'm going to talk to you about today is a session I did about 10 years ago, because I remember there was the boys at the school were seven years old, and I, to their astonishment, I said I was 77, and so we had quite a merry time about that. But that's the main topic that's going to happen, and and 
what I did with them, which included a pretty big broad horizon of history, geography, language, um, well, you'll see in a minute. However, to start off with, I already want to say, people often say to me, hey, Joan, where do you get your ideas from? Well, all I can say is, well, where don't you get ideas from? They're everywhere. All you have to do is kind of collect enough of them and mould them together and then put them into some sort of structure and shape. And, hey, you've got a lesson. Because I think the word lesson plan makes people go very formal and very funny and very scared and, and they don't really want to do it, whether it's in lines or columns or grids or however. So I've always thought that I'd like to do it as a, it's almost like a little theatrical performance. And in a way, every time you meet a group of children, why shouldn't they have the delight of a nice shapely experience that it's a little bit theatrical, perhaps, um, but why not? And it surely has to have a, a lovely beginning and a fabulous ending and some real good meat in the middle. And I've always, since I got my licentiate in 1957, and I've used Heather Gell as my model, although I must admit I have had some other wonderful teachers so like a magpie I've added a bit of this and a bit of that and collected things on the way I've always found that the way that Heather Jill said start a lesson with lots of energy and space and that awareness of space and the awareness of where you are and who else you're with that makes a huge difference so it doesn't have to be precise but it does have to show that you're getting ready to listen and getting ready to look so for me that awareness a for awareness now you can tell i'm going to be alphabetical pretty soon a for awareness and a for alertness in that first part which in the dark rose sense is part of a quick response i mean it's no good doing something next tuesday it's now this tuesday that that we're on about and the second part of her structure was always about something physical to do with the body because this is a rhythmics lesson this is a movement lesson it might be a mime lesson it might be a drama lesson it might be a dance lesson it's a movement lesson and that's where the energy comes from. It feeds itself. And if you're going to do movement, you jolly well have to have a working body. She said, hopefully at the moment with a dislocated hip. Oh, well, that'll, that'll get better. Um, so something to do with parts of the body, not just labelling them and say, you know, identifying them, but using them and finding out what sort of challenges and then what sort of skills you can employ. And the next part of the session is really about the mental thinking and deciding. Not that you haven't been already doing some decision making up till now, but the hard work of the session. And that's where I've always felt, well, it's either about note values, but the children don't necessarily know that. You don't have to tell them all what it's about. You, you, you do it. Or it's about bars and measures, and or it's about phrasing, or it's about all the Dalcro's subjects. Not that he invented them all, but they were grouped in such a way that we can see uh, some very sensible use. And then finally, let's end the session with a sort of sense of togetherness. We, we're not. It's very difficult to teach a Dalcro's session to one person. You really need that interaction and that. Uh, the, the social joining in part and and um, Miss Jill and uh, I mean I'm of a period where one called one's teacher Miss Jill um, although I guess ballet teachers have always had to put up with being kind of Miss Joan or Miss Shirley or something <laughs> it's, 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 it, but however um, Miss, Miss Jill was as old as my mother I would never have thought of calling her by her first name except behind her back <laughs> And we did call her all sorts of funny things because gel rhymed with jelly beans and so on like that. The last part of the session then could be maybe a drama or um, a, uh, a made up story or perhaps the, ex the delight of some sort of dance structure or whatever it is. Now, here I go, thinking of ideas. It's S for September. It's S for spring. Oh, the word spring itself suddenly think, well, what other movement are 
what are the movement words beginning with S? And you get slither and slide and swing and sway and so on. And think, oh, on the back of my envelope, I then think, oh, what, what sort of animals and insects begin with S? Oh, snakes and spiders and snails. It's sounding very kind of lively and sort of like six-year-olds and seven-year-olds. The idea of a spider with eight legs and a snake with no legs and a snail, is that its leg or is it its tummy that it moves on? The world is full of such amazing curiosities. So I'm thinking, I hope, a bit like a child here. My very favourite age of children to be with is about one and a half and two years old. But I'm going to be thinking today, because it's S for September, of seven-year-olds. Oh, I say the word seven and I immediately think of the seven stars, the seven sisters, the sailing on the seven seas, the seven dwarfs, the, the seven colours of the spectrum and so on. One thing just tumbles into another. And at that stage, I then say, okay, now if I were used to using one of those as my hidden theme, how would I put in note values or speed, S for speed, S for shape, S for size, and style. So we don't want everything just to be the same. Oh God, there's another S word, S for the same. Could be similar. So within that kind of, I collect stuff. I mean, as you can probably see from around me, I collect everything and people call, people call my house a bit of a clutter. But you know, it's really handy if you have lots of things because when you've got one thing, it's sort of, it's beautiful and it's interesting. But when you've got about 20 of them, you start thinking, oh, some are bigger, some are smaller, some are broken, some are complete, some are very old, some are quite new. Already, there's something that you can relate to in your body, more particularly in your mind. For me, the Dark Rose work has always been about decision making. It's about S for surprise and not predicting what's going to come next, but being on the alert for what might be possible. So I'm going to launch into a few possible things that might interest you as far as how, what could I base a lesson on, a session? Well, I want it to have meaning and I want it to be memorable. I mean, for the, for the children or the student in the class. But I'm thinking, as I said, of, of a, kids of about seven, six, seven, eight. They're very curious at that age. They like to acquire skills and challenge themselves. And so for me, language and verbal patterns are important. Visual is important to me. Clearly, what does it look like? And then what can you do about that? Can you create a visual thing out of yourself and in fact can you draw it can you s for sketch oh, i start oh where will, where will i stop stop all these ideas coming in let's just settle s for settle there it is again so i sometimes take a song uh, a little tiny song like there was a crooked man who walked a crooked mile. He found a crooked sixpence upon a crooked stile. He bought a crooked cat who caught a crooked mouse and they all lived together in a crooked little house. Now, each one of those little phrases has balance, has meaning and has its own identity. But each one of those can also be stretched S words stretched like elastic. So I like sing that to a group of children and then say, whatever is a crooked mile, kind of like kilometre. It's old fashioned for, for what you kids now call kilometres. What's a crooked man? Oh, it must be a walk that goes zigzag here and there and takes a little corner and goes over there and not just in a straight line. So here I've got a contrast already. Let's run or walk in a straight line from this end of the room to the other or run straight across it. Now, 
let's walk or run a crooked pathway, a few steps this way and a few steps that way, maybe one or two steps back, go round a corner and zigzag along again. I can play different sounds on the piano to represent that signal. I haven't got a piano with me, but you can imagine. What would you play for walking straight or running straight? And what would you improvise for going this way and that way and this way and that way and over there unevenly digging and digging? I went to the little crooked man. I'm going to use it as a body parts exercise. Oh, can you have a crooked finger? Or you can go a crooked nose? Or a crooked shoulder? Or a crooked knee? Or a crooked bottom? Or a crooked... So it goes on. And if you had a crooked toe and a crooked ankle, oh, my goodness, you'd have to walk in a very funny, wobbly way. So I'm starting to use the sense of shape on oneself in a very particular sort of way. So I think, ah, I bet the kids might not know what a sixpence is these days. So, okay, a sixpence is like a five cent or ten cents or something like that. And then it says, he found this crooked sixpence. Oh, uh, that would mean it, that it would be a lovely circular coin. How could a, a coin be crooked, so bent and twisted it wouldn't even go into a slot if it needed to pay something? And then they mightn't know what the style was unless they were kids who lived in the country somewhere. And when you get a fence and you want to go over it, you don't want the sheep and the cattle to go over it. You have a step up and a step down the other side. And so, oh, hmm, bear that one in mind. How would you make yourself into a style? Maybe you'd have to have two or three people, one kneeling or bending to be the step, another one the other side, and the person in the middle being a fence. Oh, just bear that in mind. And then how could you be a crooked cat? Would you be a cat with a crooked tail or a crooked leg? Or how would you, or even a crooked meow instead of a nice meow? How could you make a crooked meow? And as for a crooked mouse, oh, scamper away, little crooked mouse, somebody be after you. But in this particular case, they managed to live together in a crooked little house. I'm heading for the bit at the end of this little episode for a number of children to be making the architecture of a house. Uh, uh, now, Virginia, you could be a crooked door, and what do you want to be, Catherine? The window or a crooked chimney, and what, and so on and so on. Or a crooked wall, it could have a crooked pathway, it could even have a crooked doormat. So can you see that I've ended up with a cast of about six or seven people. Now, say you had... Or oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a class of that divided into sevens? Oh, 21 kids in a class, 28 kids in a class if you're in a primary school, uh, and maybe 14 if you're in a, a private studio, or well, now, of course, none. Oh, how awful. You'd have to do it with toys and things around yourself. But you could be the crooked man, and then you could be the six months, you'd be the mouse. Maybe two or three people could get together to make a style and, hey, we've got a sort of a story coming along already. And I, I wonder if I could find a piece of music to end with where the little crooked house could get built. We could use some bar times for bang and bang and bang and build and build and brick here and a brick there and a wobble there. So I can make a drama out of a tiny, tiny little song. And another one I love to do is to take a poem. And I'm sure I've done this with some of you already. I've met Heather and Wendy and Peter Roberts have been with me sometime when I've done a tiny little poem called Silver by an English author from last century called Walter de la Mer. And instead of each little phrase, I take one word at a time as if that word is to the value of a phrase. And the first word is slowly. Well, it becomes gestural. Just slowly. Can you move your eyes slowly? Your head moves slowly. A hand comes towards you slowly. So I'm exploring it's very hard for children to move slowly. So this is actually a, quite a clever poem. 
the next word in the poem is silently and almost always children will go a shush so already i've got two nice movements slowly silently and the next bit is now the moon it's a longer phrase okay three words now the moon well you could be a full moon or you could be a crescent moon not only with your arms you could be a crescent moon with your whole body sideways on and the next bit is walks the moon walking Imagine walking as if you were a moon so slowly across the sky. And the next little bit says, in her silver shoon, which is a bit of a fantasy, it's only to rhyme with moon really, but shoon, an old fashioned way of saying a pair of shoes. And then it goes this way and that she peers and sees silver fruit upon silver trees. So on the spot, it can be a lovely exploration of gesture. And then you say, oh, if I play some suitable music, could we do that? How could you move with your feet slowly? How could you move silently? And almost always, when I've done it with children, they start to involve their whole body. When it's silently, they sort of scrunch themselves up a bit. And when the moon, they kind of smile. Oh, goodness, scrunch and smile. I seem to absolutely having this alliterative S day, don't I? So there's two little things that have used parts of the body in quite particular ways. Another song that I like to use, looking back now over some decades, but it... It's never the same. It's another group of children or it's another day. It never comes out the same. But using it for, again for phrasing, Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. Now, sometimes I've used that song only to establish with a group of children what a row means. A row or a line. A line rank or file it starts you thinking about the words you use if you're file and although politically incorrect and you never know these days you might say a oh, walk in indian file <laughs> whatever that might mean but we know a file is one after the other now is a line also a file or is a row sideways next to each other like a rank like if you close ranks and you all move up closer to each other. So even the way you're facing in a row or a line will determine whether you're all walking together forward or back or whether there's a leader and you're going this way or that way backwards. And that is a really good thing about Mary Mary, quite contrary, because the word contrary can be a bit cantankerous or a bit obstinate, but can also mean the opposite. So if I said... Mary, you're a contrary girl. You're just doing the opposite. So we can make a game out of that. So if I say up, look up, Mary. Mary doesn't do that. She looks down. If I say come forward to me, Mary, she doesn't do that. She'll go backwards. So how many opposites can you trick people with? And again, this is a, a little bit of, of this age of being seven it's quite fun to be tricked and surprised and and one gets a bit of a laugh about it so i use that one but with older children um i also reveal the whole notion of there's a history to this i mean mary was mary queen of scots the half sister of elizabeth and she was very contrary she was catholic whereas the elizabeth was protestant so that that was a contrary thing and how does your garden grow or oh, well she married the Dauphin of France and, and that, that part of France was known as the garden, lush, beautiful fruits and vegetables and wine. And then it says, with cockle shells and silver bells, they were signs of the Catholic mass and pretty maids. She had many, four of her ladies in waiting 
were called Mary, Mary Carmichael and Mary somebody else or somebody else. Uh, and they, it was a very sophisticated spy ring. Of, they, they didn't just hang about as ladies and waitings. They were her, they were her intrigue and pretty maids all in a row. Well, so there's a fascinating history about it, if you want to go that path with older children. Then in each case, there are ways that I can use specific hands and feet and precise things to do things with note values. They are nearly quite contrary I use for gardening and, that, and for, for bar times. You know, if you're in a garden, what could you do that goes boom, de dum, one and two? Or what could you do that was one, two, three? Or what actions could you take to make a four time? You know, are you picking fruit or watering it or hoeing it? Or, and I don't grow cockle shells and silver bells in my garden. So what sort of garden would you like? And, you know, some class will say, oh, we want a flower garden. Other ones say, oh, you want an orchard with fruit trees. That's our garden. And someone else will say, oh, just vegetables will do. So you see, it gives me a huge scope. Now, talking of vegetables, here we get to the main bit of my chunk of today. Potatoes. As I said, it was about 10 years ago and I had a class of boys for a term. And I managed to stretch the potato theme out for five of those 10 lessons. There were a group of about, oh, well, normal sized primary school group of boys. It must have been 24, 25, 26 or so in, in the group. And the class was in the music room, uh, which was clear. There were instruments all the way around the edge. Occasionally we used them. Uh, that they could move. It, it wasn't a tiny little space. So at least we could sort of stride and gallop about and boy, did we ever. I chose potatoes, which I call spuds, because it was the international year of potatoes. And I'd done quite a bit of research about this because it was absolutely fascinating. So I know that the, the genome, or as it were, the DNA of the potato is, is in Peru. It's a world center. So. Well, Europe didn't know about potatoes for centuries and centuries and centuries. So, right, okay, well, we might have to find out a whole lot about Peru, boys. And so at seven or eight, these kids were already pretty good at not only asking their parents, but uh, they were pretty good at, at Googling around and finding out and going to the library and various of them shared up different tasks and finding out where Peru was, what it was like, what sort of costumes and what sort of songs that people, so there was a Peru thing going on. And then I managed to get another whole set of stories by the first time, as far as I know, I'll take a bit of liberty here. I mean, it's like a film script director. He may not be, he or she may not be absolutely accurate to the historical point, but by geez, it made a good story. So. So Walter Raleigh, in his visit to the New World from England, came back with some potatoes. And it's quite likely these were the very first potatoes ever to come to England. And so we made up this fantastical story about um, Sir Walter Raleigh comes and delivers them to Queen Elizabeth. And she says, oh, that looks interesting. You send them down to the kitchen. And we go down to the kitchen and, of course, the cook says, oh, what are these funny, ugly-looking, lumpy things at the end of this plant? Uh, and she chucks them away and uh, decides to boil up the leaves. And luckily, Sir Walter Raleigh said, oh, no, 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 don't eat the leaves. And they could be poisonous. Those lumpy things are actually what you, you are to, to cook with. Right. Uh, another one was the Irish famine. Mother... 1850s, there was this terrible, terrible winter in Ireland. And by then, the Irish had come to rely on potatoes heavily in their diet. But the potatoes rotted in the ground. There was absolutely no harvest. Instead of two or three harvests a year, there was nothing. And that's why a lot of Irish migrated either out, out that way to America or down our way to New Zealand and, and Australia. So 
can you see, uh, and then one more, but those, just as a tiny example, those three stories, something about Peru, something about Elizabethan times and something about the Irish famine. I mean, for the Irish famine, I certainly dressed up as a little old lady in, in Ireland and, and worried about my potatoes and they all died in the ground. Well, you can imagine if I say to a group of 20 or so little seven-year-old boys, oh, could you be a potato in the ground? And unfortunately, it's a terrible winter and you get all sort of, oh, you go soggy and, 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 and you die. Well, the operatic deaths of these children as potatoes were quite spectacular. Oh, they said, oh, I'm a diseased potato. Oh. That contrasted very nicely with our first one in Peru where we held potatoes. Oh, I forgot to tell you. I'd sent a note out to all the parents saying, could the boys just bring up potato each? And so some bought kitflers and some bought ruby browns and some bought blues and some bought nardines. And there was a whole variety. Someone even bought sweet potatoes, which we then had to say, well, it's called sweet potato, but it's not actually, it's a different sort of yam tuber. So this, the Peruvian one was a splendid procession in three time. Potato procession Peru, potato procession Peru, and so on and so on. Now, in each one, I could use the rhythmic patterns for note values of the words spuds, 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 tatoes, taties, 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 potato, 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 potato chip, potato chip, crisps, crisps. So you could put one against it, walk your feet along in spud time, boom, 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 but clap your hands in potato time, potato, 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 one side, so change over, spuds with your hands and potato, 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 potato with your feet. I tell you what, I could do every note value that you've ever thought of, and we could even do skips, roast potato, roast potato, roast potato, skip, be skip. The difficulty was when we got to be mashed potatoes, <laughs> a lot of the children in this class were Chinese. They had no idea. And it was a learning experience for me. They knew lots about rice, but they didn't know about mashed potatoes. It was a fantastic series. I managed to get language, all sorts of things in. And the Irish one, sorry, I'm darting around a bit, but I know Catherine's sort of looking at me like, I've only got a minute to go, Joan. And the Irish one, we ended up doing an Irish jig. So it came back after various things of bar times and note values and phrases. It came back to a joint dance, quite frankly. And the old Irish washing one. And so on and so on. Or fill the fleeters ball or some of them. And, and even left them with questions saying, see, who do you know? Who did your family know with an Irish name? Do you know the Murphys or the Maguires or the O'Briens? So it left them with quests in all sorts of ways. The Elizabethan one ended up, of course, with a courtly pavan for the Queen to do, followed by a nice brisk galliard. So there we are. It was about repertoire as well as resourcefulness. I had a terrific time. And when I came back at, at the next term, which of course for us begins in February, not in September. We go with the calendar year down here. <laughs> One of the teachers came up to me and said, oh, Joan, you'll never imagine what I found in my cupboard when I went to clear it out. I found some of the boys' potatoes had been left in my cupboard. But, oh, bliss, they had started to grow. And so the potatoes, they had eyes. I gathered the boys together and said, did you know that potatoes have eyes? What have they been seeing? Anyway, I took them home and I planted them and I said, in 12 weeks, I'll bring you the new potatoes. And look, where are they? Look, 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 look. Look, 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 look. See my little potatoes? They're from my garden. I grew them in a pot because I chopped the top of the eye off and planted it. There we are. And just to tell you what, ordinary potatoes about that size they turned out to be counting games. Do you remember doing one potato, two potato, three potato, four, five potato, six potato, seven potato, more? O U T spells out, so out you must go. You see, if you think about it, you can get everything from a children's game to a courtly pavan or just out of a spud. 
And that's not even looking at S for shells or S for seeds. Oh, if only I had time. Look at this shell. What a Oh, and there's another one inside it. Oh, a little cowrie shell just fell out. A little cowrie shell inside a cone shell. S for the C. And that's not even counting seeds. Yum nuts from my garden. The seeds have just come out from there. And another one from my garden. What can you imagine with that sort of spiky seed? Oh, look, I can do staccato and legato like you wouldn't believe. And then from up north in my state, the Aboriginal people have carved a boab nut. And there, I hope you can see it, there's a wandjina, a very mysterious, maybe it's originally a white owl, no mouth, the eyes. And here are the clouds and the thunder that will bring the series, the wet. Up north, they just have the wet and the dry. They don't worry about autumn and spring. So I hope on that mad fantasy, skip around the world. I hope I've shared with you things that you might adapt in your own way because the whole thing is just never ending. So thank you, Miss Jill and the teachers who taught you. And thank you, teachers who picked up enough from Jean Alcro's to turn it into something very special. And I remember some of us some years ago at a conference said, you know, if a school had any sense, they'd just employ a full-time Dalcro teacher or indeed half a dozen if they could find them because there you've got the arts covered, but also you've got science as well. The science of exploration and of curiosity. It's a fantastic thing to do. Oh, well, talk amongst yourselves. I'd need a drink of water. Outstanding, my goodness. Well, Joan, you certainly don't disappoint. Not that we expected you would. It was just delightful. Now, in good uh, virtual Dalcros fashion, we have not nearly enough time to unpack everything that Joan has just shared with us. Not even, not even, we can't even unpack just those nuts that she just pulled off of her table. Um, we, uh, we have always made a nice practice of starting on time and trying to end on time. And we very intentionally have um, tried to organize the meetups so that it's a lot of ideas um, and a lot of open questions. Um, rather than trying to claim that we finished anything, um, we're quite we're quite pleased to get a lot of neat ideas going and uh, and then leave everybody uh, back to your wherever you are to try to figure out how what are all the different things that made me think of that I and the ways I could apply with my students. Um, we have, uh, I think, 13 minutes um, left in our hour. So um, I don't think in this case, there's much that I need to say at all. I, I'm sure there'll be plenty of comments or questions. So um, this is how we leave it to you. If you have a question or comment, just wave in the screen or put your thumbs up or do the thing with the little button. And uh, by all means, make a comment or a question um, about any of the things that Joan has shared with us. So thanks, David. Thank you. Anyone? Um, Grishan. Yes, I, I didn't catch the name for the owl that oh, was on, on the okay. big nuts, the uh, Aboriginal spirit yes, owl. Yes. Can you spell it or say it? W-A-N, W-A-N, and then J-I-N-A, or it can be spelled as D-J-I-N-A, Wanjina. Uh -huh. So it's northwest, northwest. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dialects of, of Aboriginal languages. I mean, it, it, it never was a nation. It was peoples, small tribes and groups of people. So very different um, people from up, up north to down south, over east and over west, all with their own language. So that's the language of northwest, up, up in that lovely tourist area of Broome and the Kimberley. When it's, when it's not COVID time, come and come and see the northwest of Western Australia. There's wonderful, they're magical, magical people, and lots of lots of Aboriginal bark paintings on that. Very good. Um, Manuel. Yeah, thank you. Um, Joan, it was really so great to see to hear you and to see you. 
now you got me looking around my, my studio trying to, to find uh, that, that same inspiration that you say that, uh, the, that we can find from, from anything. And it was, uh, it was really a, a treat and a pleasure. And I was so happy that it fell into a, na a godly hour uh, for me here. So thank you so much for everything. I was just walking around trying to write stuff, trying to play some of the things that you were, that, that you were telling, trying to just move around and get the sense of the, uh, of the movement that I, can, that I can pull out of everything you said. And I'm going to have to rewatch this at least five times to get everything from it. So thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you, thank you Manuel. Thank you. Who else? Comments or questions? Um, Sui Ming. Um, yeah, I, I think it's an excellent time to, to, to come to this lesson. For me, um, I've been teaching uh, for a while already, but um, it's always so refreshing to, to get the input again, 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 and again, and to remind how important that imagination and creativity in the teaching of Dao Cruz Eurythmic that uh, it's not about just uh, because it needs to be so structured in the class sometimes we kind of tend to kind of oh make sure that you know we do the beats do this stuff and but how about the surprise and how to get this um, freshness of ideas and how you know just give surprise and and and, and joy and and we forgot and we kind of kind of get get into the, the content of the music uh like teaching so it's excellent to remind and then uh, also i have i'm teaching quite a lot of children now and um so i i will definitely find all this uh idea from the poems from the songs and and get them in movement Oh, Sui Ming, how lovely. And I got ideas from when I stayed with you, your lovely house in Hong Kong too. So we share it, we share it. Yeah, thank you. Very, very good. Um, Wendy, I think you have a hand up. Oh, you're muted. There we go, it's, it's me. <clears throat> um, it's just, just an interesting question when I was thinking, um, Joan, when you were talking. What would you do um, if you had a child in the class that couldn't say S's and had like maybe kind of a lisp? How would you, I'm just throwing that at you because I'm sure you're going to come back with something very interesting. So that's just a question. Yeah. What would you do if you had a child in the six or seven had, had problems speaking S's? Oh, what fun, Heather. Um, <laughs> well, amongst all my sort of bag of tricks, as well as doing Dalcros and dance and, and a bit of art and sculpturing and all of that sort of thing. I did um, a phonetics course at one stage with the speech and drama. So uh, if, you, if, you, if you go right back to how is an S produced and you start to realise, well, which part of the tongue, which part of the, the teeth, there are certain times when children can't say S's simply because they haven't, they haven't got the right teeth and the right shape or, or their tongue is lazy or something. So there's all sorts of fun speech training exercises for want of a better word that can uh, I mean even the notion can the child who not say yes can that child whistle because it's to do with with the muscles or the radiating muscles around the lips as well as the actual focusing of uh, a, a stream of air and having an example like having a hose you can put your finger on the top of the hose and as it squirts out you can adjust and the child can see very quickly that that pressure changes the way the water can spurt out of the thing. Well, it's the air spurting out of your mouth that creates it. Um, you try, you look, look, I'm sure there'll be a Google called, thing called speech training for S. Yeah. But that's interesting, yeah, cool. Very Thank good. you. <laughs> so good. Um, other thoughts, other questions? We still have a couple of minutes, which is wonderful. Um, Anyone as you're sort of Francoise. thinking back, um, uh, Francoise and then Cindy. Yes, Joan, thank you. It's so refreshing to hear you. You don't know me very well. I saw you only a couple of times in Geneva, yeah. but I remember mm -hmm. the day you showed me, I don't know how many pictures of your uh, children uh, and the spoons that you had 
brought together and each child had a spoon and and was moving like the spoon or I don't it, it was absolutely crazy and I loved that and I'm so I'm so glad to see you again today and I think that teaching adults I'm only teaching adults but I will do things like that with adults because I think that we have to refresh and to be to free ourselves also from a lot of things and just to let our imagination go. It was the little child in me which was just listening to you and that's beautiful. Thank you. It's a lot of vitamins for me. Great. <laughs> that, that's right. Um, that's wonderful. Francois, that's absolutely wonderful because it is the more you give, the more you get. It is nutritional stuff. I mean, my brain is always buzzing, even if I'm now not in a situation of teaching um, on every, every Saturday, not because of COVID, just simply because there comes a moment when you, you sort of stop teaching, but not really. And, and it is so nutritional. You, you, see, you see literally the world in the grain of sand, like that famous mm -hmm. old situation. Yeah. In that grain of sand, you can imagine all sorts of things and children are so logical I think at, grown ups forget grown up teachers often forget how logical a child's mind is and how mm -hmm. illogical we are often ourselves when we ask them to do things that they cannot possibly have yet experienced I mean you can't have options and choices which we want people to have lots of options and lots of choices and make decisions. You can't have that unless you've got a lot of repertoire, a lot of resources and a lot of experiences that you can identify and label and keep in your brain. It, it's very well worth thinking about this, making something memorable that is logical to a child or an adult, obviously, at a certain age. There comes a moment when you know it. And sometimes if you listen to, to what we say to children, it's really so stupid. It's really dopey. It's crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Cindy, I think you had a hand up and then we're getting close to time. Yep. yep. <laughs> I just loved, Joan, thank you, hearing um, how many different directions you were able to take one tiny thing in. I love that idea of, you know, you could take your potato, it could go to Peru, but then where else could it go? It could go deep underground. You're the gardener. You're all these different things. And I also really love your whole envelope idea. Um, here is the kinds of notes I write myself. Round the edges of bits of scraps of paper I have in my house. So it's good to know there are many envelope people out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I... Oh, Cindy, that's great. <laughs> so good. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just uh, I'm just as thrilled as could be. It's just really wonderful to see so many people here. It's so exciting. It has never stopped being exciting from the time we started the BDM to be able to connect with so many colleagues from around the world um, and to have a community where so many of us have been able to come back and come back again. And I feel like um, so many of you we've been able to really um, strengthen friendships with um, rather than maybe only once every four years or less. So thank you, um, everyone. Uh, again, the round of applause for Joan, who, who of course deserves so much more than that. And Stephen, can I just say, I haven't been able to read all the little comments that have been coming in. That my, my glasses at this range don't work, but I just saw Nilla Wanna's name. Pupe, I just was wearing your shirt. I hope you can recognize it. <laughs> you see the back of my shirt? <laughs> I can't. It say? So <laughs> uh, it's been fantastic. This is the first time I've done anything like this. And it's only because of Catherine who came to my place and said, it's not hard. You just press this and then you talk, but look up above there. <laughs> it's been fun. It's a fun experience for me. I've been kind of putting it off or a bit scared of all this stuff, you know. Guys, the limit now. Yeah, yeah I think yeah, so. Yeah. Well, Catherine, thank you, and Joan, you know we're going to have to ask you back again. So the sure. um, we will definitely try to uh, try to get you to come and do some more. Um, uh, <laughs> Veronica, do we have any other um, parting words? Um, just a reminder for all of you to do sign up for the mailing list. Um, 
today I made a special exception and was willing to send everybody Zoom links personally if they asked for it, but it is a lot of people. So if you can just get on the mailing list if you need the Zoom link, that would be super helpful so that we can all be in touch and um, we would love to see you all back again. Yeah, um, if, you... if anyone has any questions about the VDM or how things work, the best place to email is virtualdalcros at gmail.com. And so many of you have been. Um, and we just really appreciate everybody's friendliness and understanding. And even if it takes me or our colleagues a couple of days to get back to you, I just appreciate your patience. Um, yeah, so if you, if you check out virtualdalcros.org, there's one button for the mailing list. There's another button to subscribe to the calendar. And if you subscribe to the calendar, it'll publish all the events in your time zone. Um, so you don't have to do the math to figure out what time everything is. It'll be in your time zone. Um, and then, of course, there's the link to the archives. So you can go back in a day or two and rewatch this event and all the others um, as they go. Um, Veronica, thank you so much. Uh, Emma had to step out a little early. She's teaching. Um, for all the rest of you, please come back. Um, uh, uh, Joan, um, we will send you the chat. So you'll oh, have as much time as you like to um, to read through all the little things that people said. Um, and we hope to see everybody, everyone back soon. Thank you so Thank much, you everyone. Thank you so much, Catherine. Joan. Catherine, Thank you. Put yourself in the picture. <laughs> there we are. Take home for your children, my bottle brush and my gum nuts. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Catherine. Catherine. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Joan. Bye. Bye.